Thanks so much for the warm uh, welcome and hi also from all of us on the stage. Um, to give you a little disclaimer, uh, a conference submission is a living thing, so I had to make a little change to the title. We lose the alliteration, but um, it's more accurate this way. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to talk much about disinformation, um, but rather on misinformation. Um, so I hope not like all of us uh, in this room are leaving right now, um, but there's more talk on, on the other topic at this conference, I'm sure. Um, let me just give you a brief uh, word on what's going to happen in the next 60 minutes. So we're first going to have short, uh, we promise short presentations from each of us on just a few cases of the harms that we identify in our, in our different work contexts. Uh, so for me, I'm going to talk from the perspective of Algorithm Watch and what we investigated over the past months and years. And then I'm going to hand over to Likita to talk more about work that Amnesty Tech has been doing and then hand over to Naomi, and um, we'll save some time also to discuss the promised um, hurdles that we face in our work, but also kind of the reasons why we still keep doing what we're doing, and we hope uh, we can engage you in this discussion towards the end as well. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to also getting conversation with you, your perspectives on, on the subject, and um, the way you might want to engage in this as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to start us off. I'm going to start with the first case um, that I talked about earlier on a German-speaking panel as well, so I hope you're not bored if you attended that one. Um, but my colleague who's also sitting in the room here, Clara Hemming, uh, she led that project and it was about Bing Chat. Uh, maybe a raise of hands. Uh, who's ever heard of this even, of this application? Because who uses Bing, right? Um, a few words more on why we chose that um, application and why we chose to investigate that in a second. Um, the interesting part was that um, after a couple of months of ChatGPT, um, when it faced the, the world introduced, um, after a couple of months, Microsoft introduced um, Bing Chat. So it's a chatbot application in Bing Search, which makes it in that sense interesting because it's linked to uh, online search and it's not, lo so, so to say, enclosed in a, um, fr in a framework where it's closed off from online websites. So this was kind of the interesting thing for us to look at at this point uh, because it was the first type um, of chatbot that worked this way. Afterwards, maybe you've heard about a Google Gemini, for example, was also introduced. So it's the sim uh, same principle, but Bing Chat was first. And the problem with that, or um, we want to find out if there was a problem, um, but you are at this talk where we talk about harm, so you kind of can estimate that already, was <clears throat> that we looked in a context of elections how accurate information was that was um, asked for in, in the context of asking for political party programs, asking for simple stuff like list of candidates, um, asking for um, polls as well, so how far were parties running in the, uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the lead to the election, so to say, a few weeks earlier, and the context were federal state elections in Bavaria and Hesse in Germany, and we also looked into Switzerland um, at that same time, so in October uh, of last year. And what we found was that one third of the um, answers were clearly false, and, and some of them were clearly um, made up, made up answers, um, and some of them were sounding rather um, sense-making, so to say, but um, were false in the end. So, um, in that sense, also sometimes the, the sources. Um, like Wikipedia or like online journals, like Politico were cited even. So chat, um, Bing Chat has this function of having footnotes to, to websites and still information was false or was falsely displayed at least. So polls from different agencies were mixed up together and came to different results because the polls were from different dates or a different demography was asked um, on, on the different subjects. And I think one notable example was um, especially that the chatbot falsely claimed that the party Freie Wähler um, had lost on the polls on a certain day following allegations of anti-Semitism. Uh, against their leader, Hubert Aiwanger, so this was a real scandal at that time when we did the test, 
and the scandal actually helped the party uh, in the polls. So this was clearly also um, misinforming in a sense because people would probably make their um, adjustments in uh, who they would vote for based on that type of information, like who's leading in polls. And this was clearly um, like the opposite of what was true. Um, and then 40% of the time, uh, the chatbot um, also uh, gave kind of evasive answers. So when we asked for uh, like the list of candidates, for example, it would say something like, um, I, I can't really answer that question at this point because the list of candidates is not online yet, which wasn't even true at that point. So it was also just those um, types of answers where you would think uh, the chatbot is probably playing it safe, you know, to, to not say something wrong, but then ended up um, uh, lying altogether. Um, we tried contacting Microsoft, maybe a few words on that later. Um, for now, we just want to present what happened in a way. And uh, we found that also answers didn't improve over time. The second case I want to talk to you about is based on a story that a um, journalist, Mati Blancho, did on, for our journalism team at Algorithm Watch. He investigated um, a case where um, an AI system was supposed to be introduced by the regional government of Catalonia. Um, they wanted to bring an AI system to a prison south of uh, Barcelona. And uh, first, what maybe on the image behind me, maybe some of you recognize it, it's kind of a, like a uh, Bentham-style panopticon prison, and this is really the idea behind this type of uh, AI-based uh, prison uh, that Marty investigated. Um, Bentham had the idea that prisoners would act in a certain way to prevent troubles uh, in prison, and this was also what inspired the local government in Catalonia. So the regional government in this case, uh, um, early 2023, um, allocated 200,000 euros to a French company uh, called Enitum, and they were supposed to, to realize like a digitized version of a Panopticon-style prison. The, the idea was first to uh, assign inmates like risk profiles, basically classifying people according to their likelihood of being aggressive in prison based on some databases they would want to look into for that. And secondly, install a bunch of cameras, use facial recognition, emotion recognition, like video analysis software in general, um, to interpret inmates' emotions whenever they walk uh, the, the grounds. In January of this year, the Catalan government's justice advisor, Gemma Usabart, um, ended this project and uh, said that the public administration couldn't be oblivious to the, to the debate. And the debate she uh, referred to was the, at that point, uh, politically agreed upon AI Act, which would um, lay down rules um, on how public administration could also use AI. Um, but the AI wasn't even in effect yet, so it showed that um, this discussion had an influence already at that stage. Um, if you ask me, though, if um, like what to think about those cancellation of the plans, I would probably doubt that uh, she realized um, that the planned use of um, uh, emotion recognition software could be called um, kind of pseudo-scientific um, in its basis and not even like proven to work, um, but that she wanted to just avoid like trouble in the sense of um, acting like illegally at the end um, and also probably not saving the prisoners from like their last bit of privacy uh, in prison. Um, can we still call it a success story um, of the AI Act already? I would say kind of, because in one way, obviously, this was prevented from happening in Catalonia, but when you do a small like Google or whatever other search engine you want to use, um, search, you, um, you find different types of prisons. For example, also, um, I find one in the Netherlands where they already have such a prison in place where it's used like that, so emotion recognition software, despite being not uh, scientifically proven to work because it's very uh, simple, simple assumptions that are underlying those systems and outdated also from a research perspective um, are used just elsewhere. And the harms that are being done to people who don't really have the ability to do much against it um, has probably a lot to do with that. And the same goes also for other areas. Um, so the EU external borders are also a similar case where um, people are um, lacking, let's say, public scrutiny from helping them. 
uh, in those cases, and I think we, we have to say over the next um, couple of months and years probably if the AI can be successful in, in helping those people, I think for the field of migration probably um, the, the case is almost not lost, but uh, from a legal standpoint it's not covered um, even. So I think a good reminder to all of us to look into how public administrations are using our tax money to be um, <laughs> to be careful about uh, where it's um, implemented and um, that we all need to yeah, um, pay good attention to um, to the use of fake AI kind of in our in different contexts. In this case, in the prison. And handing over to Likita for the next case because there's more. Yeah, thanks, Pia. So I'm going to be talking about two cases today specifically that's been investigated by Amnesty Tech in Serbia and in India. Um, and uh, for both those cases, I think the insights that have come about are really a result of um, collective wisdom of everyone who's kind of worked on it. So I think what it means to investigate harms of AI are to go after people who have come before us, build on knowledge, and do it in a way that is collaborative. Um, so specifically in terms of what we say, what we mean when we say harms, I think um, um, when we talk about harms and when we talk about risks, these words often obfuscate um, what we actually mean um, when AI systems are introduced. Um, and what we really mean are that uh, when systems are introduced uh, without adequate safeguards and without checking for human rights harms, um, they unleash enormous sufferings on the everyday lives of people um, and impact them in uh, quite real and immediate ways. Um, this could be uh, for or, for example, after being flagged by uh, like a fraud detection algorithm, being unable to be uh, able to put food upon, on, on, your, on your table, or uh, if you're attending a peaceful protest, uh, being flagged up by facial recognition technology simply for exercising your right to freedom of association. So real and immediate harms um, that are basically people's rights being violated. And I think the question where AI systems are introduced in the public sector um, are particularly dire because of the interaction between residents and citizens and the immediate uh, ways that they interact with key state functions and when those are being automated or digitized or AI systems are being introduced in them, um, they have particularly dire harms, including on denials of right to social security, for example, or discrimination and so on. Um, and so, for example, uh, in the prison example or in military or policing or migration, or in the context of social security, uh, these harms can be quite uh, devastating. Um, so at uh, Amnesty Tech, we have a team called the Algorithmic Accountability Lab, which specifically focuses on the human rights impacts of algorithmic or automated decision-making systems, um, where they hinder uh, people's rights to access socioeconomic rights and where they're introduced in welfare systems. Uh, and they can also have particularly discriminatory impacts, uh, such as uh, excluding people from being able to access rights to social security, uh, particularly where they're racialized or, or where they face other forms of ethnic discrimination. Um, and so our team really um, highlights welfare systems in the introduction of such technologies and systems in the way that they entrench, mechanize, and scale existing social inequality. Um, and um, as I said, I think in the two cases that I will present today, um, the work that we've been done is collective. It's been done by Amnesty Tech researchers, regional researchers at Amnesty International, um, civil society organizations operating at the national level, and also uh, a, a brilliant investigative journalists. Um, so, in the uh, Serbia case in December 2023, Amnesty International published a large report titled Trapped by Automation, Poverty and Discrimination in Serbia's Welfare State. Um, and what the report focused on was uh, the social card registry system, which introduced uh, automated decision making um, or into the process of determining whether a person was eligible for social assistance or not. Um, and obviously this was introduced uh, for purportedly be making more fairer decisions or uh, strengthening existing social security systems. Uh, but what we found was that it had the opposite effect. Um, the work also built on um, 
a 2022 legal opinion that Amnesty International filed in the Serbian Constitutional Court with seven other uh, civil society organizations when the social card registry was being introduced. Um, and so some of the key findings of the report were that in the 18 months since uh, the implementation of the social card registry, uh, people who've been living in extreme poverty in Serbia had either their social assistance reduced or they lost it completely as a result of this automated, semi-automated system. Um, so this meant that they were left in severe financial distress and were pushed back into poverty. Um, and in particular, obviously, this had discriminatory impacts in line with existing social, um, uh, social inequalities. So people from Roma communities and people with disabilities particularly were impacted. Um, the system was built on uh, flawed or erroneous data, um, which the then, even when flagged, the social workers were often unable to correct. So there was the case of automation bias as well. Um, and then we also found that there were significant hurdles in seeking accountability when a case was uh, flagged up wrongly. So often uh, these were uh, stuck in bureaucratic hurdles, which effectively meant denying people the right to remedy. Um, and um, there's a huge uh, lack of transparency, both in terms of how the system operates, um, what the government uh, put out in terms of information, and also significant hurdles uh, in terms of, um, you know, impact, in basically in, in how the technology operated as well. Um, and the role of the International Financial Institution World Bank is particularly important to flag here. Um, the second case I want to highlight uh, is on the use of introduction of new forms of uh, technologies were introduced into um, a system called the Samagra Vedika in India, which is operating in the state of Telangana in the context of welfare delivery in the state again. Um, and so really in January 2024, uh, investigators and journalists uh, published an investigation in Al Jazeera. And this investigation was done in partnership with the Pulitzer Center's uh, Artificial Intelligence Accountability Network um, that uh, really looked at how this uh, Samagra Vigitara system, which is a digitized form of welfare delivery system, when introduced in Telangana, um, led to denials of the right to social security of many people. Um, and so for Amnesty International, following the publication of this report, um, we felt that it raised significant human rights concerns uh, about uh, people's rights to social security and many others. And we published a technical explainer um, just last month um, on uh, uh, the underlying text system that underpinned the Samagra Vedika. Um, and so the focus of the technical explainer was the use of entity resolution software, which attempts to connect uh, various data points across databases um, and find duplicates, for example, and uh, establish a single source of truth, so to say. Um, and basically, in the context of Samagra Vedika, errors in this process uh, could have led um, and raised the risk of human rights uh, harms by being excluded, uh, and the incentive structures for, for example, flagging something, someone for risk um, are anyway skewed to detect welfare fraud, um, so this posed a particular human rights risks as well. Um, and finally, uh, the technical explainer also uh, focused on lessons learned by Amnesty International's attempt to carry out a full algorithmic audit. Um, ultimately, that was not possible due to the enormous opacity and challenges that we faced uh, in investigating the system uh, and hurdles in procuring uh, the software. So uh, a lesson was also to adapt um, methods um, in, in response to government opacity. I'll stop there. And hand it over to Naomi. Thank you. Yeah, so I also um, take over the baton and continue talking about um, states' uses of harmful automated systems. And um, I want to discuss two very different cases. Um, and then afterwards, I also highlight briefly one case of, of the private use of uh, development and use of problematic discriminatory AI systems. But the first of these um, government cases I want to discuss might be quite familiar to a lot of you, and it is the um, child benefits um, 
scandal in the Netherlands, which was um, a system developed to uh, uh, scan and address people committing welfare fraud. Um, and this fun system explicitly functioned to target um, and apply heightened scrutiny for people with a double nationality and, and also targeted people explicitly based on specific nationalities. Uh, so it was very clearly and explicitly discriminatory in its functioning. But this was uh, far from the only issue because this um, discriminatory focus was combined by, uh, with an attitude of every single mistake is a case of the highest form of fraud. So 10 euros misplaced means you have to pay back five years of child benefits. Um, and also combined with hardly any way to challenge or legally challenge uh, um, uh, these fines that you would be getting. So the harms here were immensely extensive. Um, children were, were replaced out of homes, uh, people lost their houses, their apartments, uh, people had to file for bankruptcy. So the impact um, really cannot be overstated in a lot of cases, I think. Much more to say about that, but I want to highlight also a second very different um, case of um, AI systems used by governments. And this is um, the Israeli Defense Forces alleges use of an AI system called Lavender. Um, there was extensive investigative journalism reporting that these systems are used to generate uh, targets for strikes and specifically so-called dumb bombs, so uh, unguided missiles. Um, and I think it's especially important to highlight this uh, because of, um, if only because of the horrible massacre last night in Rafah, uh, not only 48 hours after the International Court of Justice ordered Israel not to invade. So allegedly this system um, automatically, automatically tar um, generates targets with very little human oversight checking whether or not um, they, within the boundaries of, of international law, would amount to a legitimate target, and also combined with a very high tolerance for civilian casualties. So I, I don't think I can put into words here, of course, what the harm is we're talking about here, and I trust um, that you yeah, understand it also without spelling it out. So there's, of course, not really um, a transition to make from this, but I also wanted to discuss another case um, of the private development. Oh yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting my slides. These were the previous informative slides. <laughs> uh, and this one is on the case I want to discuss now, so you didn't miss much. Um, yeah, the, this case is on a racist online exam software that uh, me and a couple of colleagues uh, litigated in front of the Dutch Human Rights Institute. Um, it is the case of Robin Pokorny, a black student at uh, the Free University in Amsterdam who had to take exams during COVID um, and to prevent students from committing fraud. Um, they had to use uh, this specific software that would give them access to the, the, yeah, the exam questions. And part of what that software did was uh, before you got, got access to the questions, you had to go through a facial scan. You had to scan your desk, you had to scan your face and your student ID. And for some reason, Robin repeatedly was unable to pass the facial detection uh, phase. Well, this problem was shared by hundreds of uh, uh, brown and black students from over the entire world that had to use the same software in this period. So in the end, um, Robin figured out that if uh, she put a lamp directly in her face, she would be able to enter the exam. But of course, you can imagine the stress. Um, yeah, the fact you're being discriminated uh, for entering uh, your exams. And I think it's also important here to emphasize that the harm we're talking about or the, the, um, what this case tells us is not just the extra time that you lose from your exam, um, not just the stress, 
um, and not even only uh, um, the real pain that comes from being discriminated by your own um, institution of learning, but in its completion, this entire case also really highlights how challenging it is to um, try to address and speak up about algorithmic discrimination. The university ignored the complaints. It took us more than a year to get them to actually acknowledge her existence and that this perhaps was something they should talk about. Um, and then the legal phase really shows some key uh, holes and problems we have with regard to how we legally conceptualize and address these, the discrimination in these type of algorithmic systems. And uh, I think we can continue on that later. Okay. Um, I guess we're going to ask each other questions and have a conversation now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I guess my first for you is Naomi. Why was it so hard to uh, talk about the structural aspects and prove um, the threshold for discrimination in the case you just spoke about? Yeah, there are uh, several um, things that come together here, I think, in a very toxic cocktail. The first, of one, first is that there was no clear institutional route to complain about this type of discrimination. Because they, they, we kept running upon a wall where they said, no, 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 racism or discrimination in general is uh, something that someone does to someone else. Mm. So you need a specific uh, act or someone needs to say something and then you can use the complaint route for discrimination. But that's clearly not the case. You're talking about general policy and we don't do complaints about general policy. Go to the student council. That was basically the response. So that's a clear gap in our thinking about what uh, a discrimination is to begin with. And the second big problem was the fact that this is a proprietary software. So the university itself has no idea how it functions. They have uh, defended it for more than three years now, but they have no insight in the actual functioning of the software. Um, so we had to rely on investigative journalism and researchers um, reverse engineering the software and, and, and testing its performance, which gave us a lot of insight, but is of course never the same as actual independent auditing, which by the way had been done mm -hmm. specifically on this point, but the company developing the software refused to share it. And the final point that was really um, a hurdle is that the court only looked at the specific, like three specific exams that she took and whether or not it took her longer to enter the exams, yes or no. That was the full extent of their legal test, which completely disregards the structural nature and the, the, of how um, you even approach software or a system being discriminatory, being racist. So that is, for me also laid bare a very clear um, yeah, limit in the legal conceptualization of what algorithmic discrimination is. Thanks for elaborating. Um, it's going to be a f bit funny because we're going to switch between topics, I guess, so I hope you can, <laughs> you can all follow. I was maybe wondering in, in the case that you presented, Likita, about um, Serbia and also the, the case in India. I was just wondering in general, like, how do you get to uh, investigate those uh, cases in the first place, because you also mentioned that you have a very collaborative style, you work a lot with civil society actors on the ground. Was this something that was brought up to you by those actors, or did you get a lead somewhere else and um, get to start on this? Yeah, I think um, some, basically the most key approach that we want to take uh, at Amnesty Tech is to uh, do interdisciplinary work, uh, which is to uh, investigate the technical aspects of the system, but also through uh, traditional human rights methods, uh, talk to people about how uh, those are impacting them in uh, traditional ways. So really a socio-technical framing, um, and that's, uh, I mean, that's been at the core of our um, 
approach as well. And I would say uh, generally in both the Serbia and the India case as well, um, it's not a question of doing research or investigations for the sake of that. I think in all of our work, our, our methods are enmeshed with you know, doing, uh, pushing for stronger AI regulation, um, fighting back against these, basically speaking to your point, on these parallel regimes. One system for migrants, um, you know, one system for national security exemptions, to really look at uh, AI regulation more holistically. And finally, also to talk about communication and storytelling as a key aspect of this for two reasons. One, of course, to center people's stories, but also, I would say, because we're up against this like really strong power differential and this dominant industry narrative of what AI is, um, to really break that apart. Um, and, you know, communication specialists in our team are doing a great job to talk about that as well. So that's kind of where we're, uh, w what our focus and approach has been. I think, of course, there's challenges as well. And I think one of the key ones that I feel like both of you spoke to uh, was about Firstly, snake oil technologies and the role of companies in producing them, um, both in the prison example, but also otherwise. So what, what according to you, are the um, dangers of private sector use and produce? development and deployment of these technologies. Mm. If you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, you speak to the truth in a way because it's um, it's not new as well. It's just many of those applications were also in the room many years ago, but now they call it AI in a way. So that's, I think, the first point that you addressed that snake oil um, topic. Um, I don't know if you're all aware of the term, but it's kind of used to, to describe AI that's that's promising a lot, but not delivering, and probably in many cases not even containing what you could maybe technically call AI, like machine learning um, applications. Um, so I think to to just um, break the the intransparency, uh, break it up, and also also through the channels of regulation is really one of the key steps, I think, that we're all kind of striving forwards to, because it also just makes it easier to address uh, those those dynamics and structures to, to also um, maybe help public administration also to open their eyes to, uh, to the false promises that are made to them as well. Um, obviously, they're in this responsible seat as well to, to make the, the assessments, um, but also for them, uh, it's sometimes the restraints that, that are there that um, um, make them uh, make them think they are making a smart choice in, in this case, and I think it's just this kind of collective exercise of getting to, to a real point of having full, full scope of information and then decide from there if, if we want to even proceed. But in other cases, I think it's not only on the, on the companies, obviously, but also this whole um, point I tried to make also with the prison example was also the idea from the start was just fault, uh, faulty in a way mm -hmm. to, to use this type of um, system. And it's not been made up maybe by the companies, but obviously promoted as an idea that could help them in, in their way of um, handling challenges maybe that come up uh, in the prison uh, day to day. Um, but doesn't really speak to what the real solutions would be probably. So I think we really have to be careful not to uh, take the public administration, pub take the public sector completely out of uh, responsibility as well. I think, um, Naomi, maybe you could even speak to that a bit more as well, because I feel like the Netherlands has been maybe famously known also for many attempts to to automate the public administration, yeah. and there's been so many stories about that as well over the Yeah, and I really years. like your framing at the end there also, because I think often um, like the, the part of this bigger, powerful narrative um, is that, oh, if we see harms uh, and problems with AI, then that's a technical bug that we need to iron out. Um, and then we're on our merry way again. So it's a technological problem that warrants a technological solution. But I think if we serve you the uh, um, survey, the different examples we have here discussed of, of public sector use of these type of systems, it, the harm does not come from an error in how these systems function. They function exactly often how these governments intend them to do, and especially also in um, the example of the um, Dutch childcare benefits 
scandal, which was just they automated the discrimination. It was not that the system went haywire and something went wrong in the data collection and suddenly there was a bias in the machine that we have to exercise. No, this uh, technology just enabled the government to do what they wanted to do uh, more efficiently and on a bigger scale. And I think a lot of these examples are like that. I think the prison example is also a beautiful uh, example of that because it's just problematic inherently what they're trying to do, uh, regardless of the type of technology you use. Um, and that also comes back to what you said earlier, that in the places where citizens and people are most vulnerable, if we're talking about policing, welfare, borders, military, those are the same contexts where a lot of the regular safeguards and transparency and rights just do not apply, um, making this even an even bigger problem. But to shift the narrative slightly, I think one of the topics that was very much underlining um, all the different cases um, that you through had was um, challenges in data collection uh, in both the private and public sector and I thought it might be nice to compare notes mm -hmm. on what those challenges were. Um, so, I mean, from both the cases in Serbia and India, I think there's... Firstly, I think the challenge, at the core of it, is the challenge of power differentials, uh, which is the difference between the investigator or the rights holder with the uh, enormous backing that the state comes with in pushing its national security interests or in pushing its uh, efficiency interest. Um, and then when the um, question of power differential comes to companies, it's about proprietary software, it's about uh, trade secrets, it's about intellectual property. So keeping this in mind, I think basically the first thing that comes up as a hurdle is um, you know, denials of information, um, the opacity that is the deliberate opacity, even when questions are asked or freedom of information requests are filed, the, the denied, particularly in the context of social security, um, citing proprietary reasons. Um, and in context of, for example, uh, tech that is used in military and security uh, on the grounds of national security. Um, so uh, that's basically the core challenge that is of transparency and um, there's obviously, you have to kind of look at ways to um, work around it, which is that, okay, you may not have the full information of how the system's operating, but it is enough to specify the harm on the individual. So that is kind of looking at um, the real world impacts as opposed to you may not have, you may not know who the exact investor is or what the data points are all the time, but to kind of find information around that by stating the real world impacts. Uh, the other is to name and I think through looking at mixed methods, so government data, uh, presentations done, to look at who are the drivers of the system. And I think the role in the, for example, in the Serbia case, uh, was to fi find uh, the role of the public banks, uh, World Bank, sorry, in publicly available information. Um, and in that particular case, also see how uh, this international financial institution through presentations and through documents and through like uh, agreements really drove the establishment of the social card registry uh, which formed the basis of this entire system. Um, so looking at publicly available information as well. Yeah, um, the same goes for us I guess um, when it comes to freedom of information requests. I think there's still great, especially in Germany through, we have this great website, uh, Fragt den Staat, so it's a very handy website uh, if you want to demand uh, information from especially public administration in Germany because it really centralizes a lot of the information requests also in one place, makes it very easy to search. So I think that's been a great achievement of the past years and definitely helpful, but we also see the same issues that you're addressing, uh, proprietary uh, systems um, that also public administrators are not willing to um, to kind of uh, challenge in a way. Um, I still see some development, some hope in when it comes to certain uh, public administration users and the developments there to, to create a bit more transparency, at least in Germany. Um, but I think it's still 
it's still very clear to all of us three that the applications that we are talking about here about uses in the in the context of migration in the context of military those are not the ones we are supposed to uh, know about so this still remains the largest challenge for us as well as an organization um, maybe on the on the Bing case I think uh, still um, still a different I mean, it's a different type of topic we're talking about altogether, obviously. Um, misinformation, it's an issue, but it's not um, a harm comparable maybe to other harms that we talk about on this panel. I'm, I'm aware of that, so bear with me. But I think it's still helpful to, to also, in those cases, showcase at least um, how um, we can try new channels, new ways to investigate um, those harms. So in this case, um, um, we, we kind of try to reverse engineering approach as well, mm. prompting automatically and then uh, analyzing systematically to, to kind of build a, to build a new sphere of knowledge um, around the system that seems so opaque to us as well. Um, I think we can't leave out the new regulatory frameworks as well uh, and need to address them here that they, they offer new chances, so uh, in this case especially the Digital Services Act uh, technically, at least theoretically, allowing us to request information from companies, and we still got to see, I guess, in the coming years how, how well that's working for us. But um, with the AI, maybe it's a bit less promising, especially when we talk about the cases mm -hmm. that, that we addressed here on this panel. Um, I'm wondering, um, Naomi, could you expand maybe on litigation? Like, what's been your approach there? How was your experience also with the, the Dutch Institute for, for Human Rights? Because I feel like what you addressed, that um, the anti-discrimination legal frameworks don't really fit those cases as well. Um, I'm wondering what's been changed maybe about that uh, coming yeah. from that case, or if there's not so much to report on. Yeah, no, um, so in the end we lost. But I still feel that a lot of as aspects have been a success. Um, and the most important thing for me is why did we do this case even? Where did it come from? Um, and there, it really came from the work we were already doing combined with um, the work Robin herself was doing, because she experienced this. She, she herself is a computer scientist and incredibly smart, so she knew what was going on, right? She saw, okay, this is, this is more than just a bug or a little issue, but there's more going on here. Um, and then we basically found each other um, in this work um, and were able to, to do this together in a way um, that I think was very productive in the sense that there was never like I'm like none of us are official attorneys in that sense because it's a complaint procedure where um, you don't need like a, a barrister or someone officially uh, um, uh, yeah trained as an attorney so we were able to really do this as a team and do this together um, and for me, in any type of strategic litigation, that is one of the core things you should have, um, is leading from what the actual problem is that people are experiencing in the way that they want it to be addressed. Um, and this procedure also really fit best what Robin wanted in this case, because she didn't want any damages or anything like that. The aim really was to make a statement and to make clear that this is not okay. And that is something we really succeeded in doing. We really put this topic of algorithmic discrimination in our local national context. We're able to put this on the map. Um, and a lot of people were very shocked by the results that we lost in the end. And that also had a very clear function in that it, to me, um, is a very clear example of where um, these frameworks just simply fall short and where it makes clear who they do protect and who they don't. Um, and that's not a solution, but making that clear and visible um, for those who have the power to fix that um, is already a real step. Thanks for exploring that. I think we could probably continue 
conversing for a long time still and talk about hurdles. Um, maybe before uh, we open up for questions and answers, um, I hope some of you uh, are still around. Yes, um, there are also microphones on the sides. Um, you could just walk up and and talk uh, if you like. Um, maybe in the meantime, um, what's your next steps? <laughs> I still what? have a question for mm -hmm. you. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Because you mentioned a couple times the role of uh, 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 the World Bank, mm. and the first time I heard about that case, I was very confused by that. I was like, how does this add up? Um, and I was also pretty shocked when I someone explained to me the full context of that. So I can imagine that there's a lot of people here who don't know how uh, the World Bank plays into the development of these systems in Serbia. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the World Bank in general is putting in a lot of investment into public sector um, infrastructure, so to speak, especially in the Western Balkans, um, including in Serbia. Um, and a particular focus of their work is to comprehensively reform uh, state functions or public security systems. Um, and um, so in the case of Serbia, um, the World Bank funded the establishment of the social card registry, um, which of course led to the social card law, and then that uh, basically led to the system of semi-automated decision making, uh, which said you are eligible for welfare and you're not. Uh, but the most shocking thing I think about this is that um, as part of this um, loan agreement, it was a precondition to establish this registry. Um, and so uh, very much uh, international financial institutions driving in the name of public sector development or updating or uh, you know, uh, making these systems fit for purpose, introducing data fight systems without checking for the human rights harms as part of loan print conditions, which is, I think, quite dire, um, and particularly in middle to low income countries, which is again goes back to the point of who's most impacted by these technologies. And of course, the regulations happening at the EU level, EU AI Act and Council of Europe are key steps, but the, a lot of harms that we're seeing um, are in middle to low income countries, including in the global majority. So I think the power differential, of course, stands there as well for us to really name and investigate further. Okay. Um, if you just want to talk about systems that you recently learned about and that we should know about, also tell us. <laughs> um, this is an open space. Not, not only questions allowed, uh, also statements, um, if anyone feels like uh, talking to us about it. But if not, it's also fine. I think we yeah, can... Ah, there. over there. Go up to the you mic. just walk up to you. the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you so much for the discussion. I have a genuine question about how to square all the incredibly important concerns that you raised and the energy in the digital public infrastructure, digital public goods sessions, where coming also from your background, I don't feel like there's enough emphasis on the risks and the safeguards that are needed. But when you enter these spaces and bring up these concerns, you often sound uh, pessimistic, like you're not invested in using technology equitably globally, and it sounds like a bit, yeah, aspects of this are like tech for good narratives that we've been confronted with for a while, yeah. but I also sense that this has a different kind of quality and that we as a field also need to say, how do we make constructive proposals as well? This is sort of my observation. I have no answer myself, but if you have any thoughts on this, I'd be super curious to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, one of the core questions, right? Because it's a very stark difference in, in attitude that you can see. And for me, the difference really comes down to what is your... How, how do you view these technologies? And for me, this is politics. We're talking about politics here. We're not talking about the, 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 the technical, how do you develop this yes, no. Um, how do you build a road, how do you build a bridge that doesn't collapse but works? For me, we're, it's core, at the core, really, politics. 
um, if we're talking about social welfare systems and optimizing them and making them more effective, to what end? What is the goal here? And if the political system, the political climate is geared towards seeing uh, uh, welfare fraud as the m most horrible thing a person could ever do and taking welfare to begin with is basically a crime, if that is the political attitude, um, no amount of tech, no matter what type of tech, even no tech, <laughs> you can also discriminate with pen and paper. Um, so that to me is the core of the issue here, right? So um, in the end, I always feel that these um, contradictions are a bit void because it is not about the technology. It's about the structures that underlie them and that these systems can help to exacerbate or perhaps not, but that's that's another question. But I can imagine you also have a lot of thoughts here. Yeah, I, I mean, I, t I totally agree with your point on the fact that it is politics and it's the fact uh, that it is a question of um, doing the work of accessing justice and all of these questions. So in, in terms of like, what are the logics that underpin it? Um, then our ways of resistance, whether it be investigating or advocacy and so on, also need to move beyond looking at just the tech. So um, fundamentally the question of the welfare fraud is a politicized question. Who does the welfare fraud? Why are we so invested in catching the welfare fraud applicant? It is because of, um, you know, we want borders, or the EU wants borders to be fortressed. And where um, there is, uh, where you let migrants in, obviously you create dual systems. Um, and then really create a system where, or a narrative where we are saying that, um, you know, there's enormous leakages in the system. So in that sense, I think the political question is to do beyond the tech, it's like to look at the rise of authoritarianism, it is to look at also the rise of uh, far-right movements, especially in Europe, if we're talking about Europe right now. Um, so I think I g generally see resistance as a constructive uh, way as well to talk about these things. Yeah, I'm gonna repeat whatever uh, you all just said, but I think I can only agree that um, also the tech for good people sometimes have similar issues, let's say, also in, a, in uh, getting data, for example, to build like smart uh, technology that could actually be helpful in certain scenarios. I mean, I think what we also do at Algorithm Watch often is to, to enter a discussion by saying we're not against um, AI in all contexts um, imaginable, let's say, to, to maybe soften the blow from the start because it's probably not a wise idea to, to create those clashes and then to go ahead and talk about the, the principles behind um, how AI should be used or in what scenarios from a kind of public interest perspective uh, AI can be used in, in a good way. Um, but then obviously the room, the discussion room needs to be open enough as well to go that far and to, to, uh, to, discuss, it, to discuss it from the ground up, let's say, not to, to already um, be ahead in a discussion uh, 10 times um, further ahead to, um, to, to, uh, to be at that point where we just discuss yes or no questions. Uh, obviously, that's not helpful, but I think all of us try to be constructive in this way, and obviously we're in a, in a space where we also need to, we feel the need to, to bring up um, um, topics like this today because we feel there is a, um, there is a space uh, that's um, trying to be, or that's, that's been dominated by this other narrative and that we need to counterbalance a bit, so I think to be just be honest about that as well, that we, we feel the need to address it in that way, um, maybe also creates understanding in other cases. Yeah. And perhaps also one additional point, that's less of an additional point, and yeah, more of the, the point we perhaps should have started with, which is questioning who is having this discussion to begin with, right? Because if the framing is, how do we influence a couple of uh, government policy people um, to do the principal thing? I think a lot of that, that's already, then you're already missing, I think, the core point of who is actually experiencing what is going on. 
um, and the reality that the uh, um, those making these policies, making these decisions, are often very, very far removed from the reality they are helping to create. Um, and I'm also not the person to have a solution in that regard. Um, but I think that's one of the core lenses through which you can continuously ask, like, who is the we in a conversation? Um, who is having the conversation to begin with and who isn't? Do we have any other people in there? Yes. Can I ask a question? Hi, I'm Stefan, AI researcher from Jülich, and I wanted to ask what AI research can do to make less things go wrong and to make <laughs> more things go right. <laughs> I guess it depends on the type of research. Um, I think, Naomi, you said it well, to, to start with the question of to what end um, are you developing or researching AI, but maybe you can give us a bit more detail what you work on specifically, that would be helpful. Yeah, one of, like, um, we are um, developers of uh, AI for science a lot in, in, in lots of different ways, like how can uh, machine learning bring different AI fields forward. We are also working on uh, European open large language models that are an alternative to, to commercial offers. Uh, so we are part. We are trying to be part of of the like the AI research uh, at the main conferences and try to contribute to the dialogue there. Um, and what I feel here is like a, a lot of like um, like for, or for my, my perspective on AI is uh, very different. Like it's stupid comp computer programs that are not fit for any purpose. Like how can they do so much harm without uh, like the person using it in the wrong way? Uh, and so I would like to understand. Do we have to change our narrative of how we communicate what AI is? Do we, sh should we change the process? Or because, like, we can think about building more safe technology, but this is, this is, this is difficult because safety is also uh, context dependent. Like, how are you using it? So, what can safety mean? And maybe you have some ideas on what could guide us. I think that's you know, getting right to the point also of the main critique maybe of the AI Act, which follows a risk-based model and you can't really assess sometimes the risk before you even know the context in which an AI system is used. So thanks for the great um, comment. I think probably none of us has like a final answer on what to do <laughs> in those scenarios, but um, implementing risk assessments from the very get-go and maybe contributing also to developing frameworks to, to do algorithmic auditings, to do risk assessments, to help like also um, in a collaborative setting, help everyone understand like what, where the, um, the risks that we could expect even, where could they be lying, you know, like where could uh, bias be, be hidden, where could we uh, face uh, issues when it comes to applying it in contexts um, that are maybe risky or where should there be a disclaimer on a paper like this should never be used in a case of uh, social security distribution like those ty kinds of um, discussions need to happen and um, probably you could even be helpful in, in collaboratively discussing them in scenarios where not the researchers only by themselves uh, are discussing with each other but uh, we probably need your insight as well to know where to look for for issues that might come up in the future. But that's just my take, so take it from there. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you're developing um, systems aimed at practical use, I would say ground them in the praxis you want them to be used in. And that means involving the people who know that practice and that, yeah, so that completely depends on, on, on the context we're talking about, but I think that's core understanding, because um, I, I think you're absolutely right in, in the intuition of saying like, hey, but what about the context, we're blaming the system, um, and I agree there, because I think if you look at these cases, um, it's a complete symbiosis of the entire process, right? Where this forms one aspect. And as the people developing that one aspect, I think you can take responsibility by understanding the bigger whole in which it is aimed to be implemented and yeah, taking some responsibility in that regard. Um, so that means involving more people, that means interdisciplinary research, um, that means it takes longer, <laughs> and some things shouldn't be done, and others should. But it's, it's all quite abstract, because I think it does depend 
on the context in which we're talking. I mean, I'm going to repeat, I think, the, some, some of the points that have already been made, but I think practical ways um, identify where this is going to be deployed, and then before ever deploying, do participatory research and consultation. Um, and if there needs to be tweaks made, um, that should be led by the communities of people. And they should have a say on whether it's deployed or not, um, and then in what manner. So like building those perspectives within the research pipeline as well, I think, um, will be really key to do. And then obviously, as you said, like the context is key. So uh, the research has to look at what context, what are the power structures, who um, are there transparency built into these within the government institutions that they'll be deployed in, and what from um, the research and development deployer perspective could you make transparent as well from your end? So I think these are some questions that could possibly be helpful to think through. Were these our final words? I think so. Thanks, uh, Lukita Thanks Naomi, so, yeah. for explaining on this. Yeah. Uh, we'll close it here. We're still a bit around for um, yeah, final questions you might have or for any conversations you might want to have with us. Um, thanks so much for coming um, and for your questions and input.